Thank you, and welcome to our webinar today. We are excited that you uh, have joined us today, and we're extremely excited that Todd Whitaker is sharing his time with us today. Um, Todd is a professor of educational leadership at Indiana State University. Uh, he is one of the nation's leading authorities on employee motivation and leadership effectiveness, and in, we all have read his works, I'm sure. I've been following that on social media, and his mess, his messages just resonate, you know, with leaders all across our nation and internationally as well. He's also written over 20 books, so he has a vast knowledge to bring to us today. And Todd, we thank you for sharing your time with us, and tell us about shifting our monkey. <laughs> Sure. No, I'd love to. How's everybody doing today? I'm glad to see my friend in Willowbrook, Illinois there. So good to see you in Vegas and uh, Virginia and Iowa. And so it's uh, very exciting for me. Uh, normally, I wouldn't be quite so dressed up, but I got up this morning and ran and then drove 125 miles to Kansas City to present to a group of superintendents and drove back uh, just in time uh, to be here. So I'm honored. But, but you need to know that's not the reason I look so tired. Last night was my wife's birthday, and so we went out, and it turned into a celebration. A bunch of people came and all that, so it's kind of a late night, but that's not even the reason. It's because I had this really, really strange dream. I dreamed I was eating a muffler, like a muffler fell off a car, and I was trying to eat it, and it'd be like a little bite at a time, and it was so hard, and it was so tough to chew, and I woke up this morning trying to eat that, you know, think about eating that muffler, and I woke up this morning, and, and, and I was exhausted. So, anyhow, um, you can put that's funny in the box if you want to, but just leave it blank and pretend your box isn't working if it wasn't funny. So, today we are going to talk about shifting the monkey, and I call this, Have You Shifted Your Monkey Today? And it's all about realigning responsibilities. One way to think about things in schools or in life or in wherever organization you're in is that many times things are done very disproportionately that there are some people that seem to do an incredible amount of work and some people to do seem to do very little work. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to rebalance that world. But one of the things that I want my leader friends here to be aware of, this is not about take, you taking care of yourself. I think average people do that. You know, when you think about it, there are a lot of people who avoid responsibility and they take care of themselves. What we're talking about is the highest level leader, the very best people. And what they do is they, they're going to have to take care of themselves during this process. But the other thing they do that's very different, they take monkeys off of good people and put them on them. And then take monkeys off of them and put them on people that probably would benefit from having more responsibility. So rather than just thinking about how can I protect myself, and this is part of it, and we'll talk about some examples there. I also want us to think about how can I protect the very best people in my organization? Because so often things are very disproportionate. Think of it, here's a real quick example. I am guessing that many of you have more than one secretary, office worker, receptionist in your school. Many of you don't, some of you might not have any. But many of you have more than one. Oftentimes if we have more than one, they may not be equal in ability and effort. And if you can think of this, sometimes we'll be in a school where we'll have one clerical worker receptionist who, when we walk in, they smile, look up, and say, hi, can I help you? And we may have another one that does a better job of avoiding responsibility by hiding behind their computer screen. Well, what happens in many organizations, in way too many organizations, is the person who smiles and says, hi, can I help you, keeps getting the additional responsibility. And the person who takes more of a negative attitude, tends to be an avoider, gets less of the responsibility. And I always say, we have to make sure we balance the world by doing this. Never ask the best clerical person to fold and staple. Ask the less effective, less hardworking clerical person to fold and staple. Because if we ask the best person to fold and staple, they'll do it and they'll do it right. But you know what we do? We keep them from doing things only they can do. And what happens is if we let the other person off the hook by not giving them tasks that are more tedious, because of the fact they'll botch it up, because of the fact they'll complain, because of the fact they'll be negative about it, they may not even do it or do it right. What happens is if you can see this, we do something I call punishing people for being good. And as a leader, we have to be so cautious and make sure that we do not do that. So we're constantly trying to rebalance this. And let's think about a couple of reasons this happens. One of them is this. 
One of my favorite quotes is this, very seldom do the loudest barks come from the smartest dogs. Not only do we think of the greasy uh, as the, 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 the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but oftentimes what happens is we avoid those issues. The people that tend to be most negative or complain the most, and because of that, then they do less and less than other people. The compliant, friendly, nice people who are very good at tasks, then what we do is we give all the tasks to them. We have to delegate. Here's a way for a leader to think about delegation. As a leader, you have to delegate everything anyone else can do because there's so many things only you can do. However, the thing that's so essential is we have to delegate the importance of the task with the importance of the person. One of the ways I think about leadership and one of my very favorite thoughts is this. The problem isn't that we have ineffective people doing important things. The problem is we have effective people do unimportant things. And by doing this, what we do is we're literally piling it on our most effective people. And that's such a negative impact. You know, it's, it's interesting because of the fact that we're all facing in some states more than others and some areas within every state are looking at a teacher shortage. And I want us to keep be aware of something. People don't quit their jobs. They quit their bosses. And if you're a leader that tends to dump and overwork on your most effective people, realize those are the people that have the most ability to leave because they have lots of choices and they're not going to be devalued. Your people who have less ability to lead, leave understand don't have that choice, but your very best people do. I would say nobody quits for $3,000 difference in salary. They just tell you they quit for $3,000 because they don't want to say you're not effective. So we have to think about the world in this light is that we've got to make sure we, we give tasks to ineffective people, but they have to be tasks that are about the importance of the ineffective people and, and not over dump on our very best people. One way to think about it is this. I used to always ask as a principal my three worst teachers to be in charge of the Christmas party. I love Christmas. I love holiday parties. I love them wherever I'm at, everything. I like it if we have an Arbor Day party. I mean, so all of those things are really important. However, the challenge is in many schools, we ask our best people to do tasks like that that other people can do. The reason we have to ask less effective and less productive people to do the Christmas party is because we can't ask them to do the math curriculum. Because if we ask them to do the math curriculum, they'll go back to Gazintas. You know, four goes into 16, five goes into 25, a little Beverly Hillbilly humor there. And instead, what we have to do is we have to make sure that the importance of the task goes along with that. So and when you think about when we're doing this, I would ask three teachers that tended to not seek out responsibility to do the Christmas party. I'd ask them one at a time. I'd ask them in August. And I talk about the fact that, you know, there's a holiday party. Would you mind being a part of it? It's a planning. It's a, there's a bunch of people on it. It's not till December to make it as appealing as possible. When I got three people, then I would talk to the faculty about we have a, a Christmas party planning committee. They're ready to go funnel ideas to them. And that would be something where then they would have a task. Because if we don't give tasks like that to them, then many times we don't give any tasks to them. And the last thing we want to do with people who tend to not be the most productive or even tend to lean toward negative is give them more free time. And then what happens is then that's, that's a negative issue that way too. So we're going to think about it in this light. We're going to try to rebalance the world, but we're going to put the importance of the task on the importance of the people and then work on down to make sure we have our less important tasks on our less important people. Think about it another way. I have been at two universities. I'm at the University of Missouri now in Columbia, and I'm very excited to be there and honored. And I was at the Indiana State University, the home of Larry Bird, for many years. And I remember one time the president of the, I'm, and I'm nobody, I am nobody at these places. And the president of the university came over to me and said, Todd, would you mind being a part of this committee? And I said, I'd be happy to if that's the single best use of my time. Because if it's the single best use of my time and you have to make that decision, then that's exactly what I want to be putting my time into. However, if it's something that you don't see as the best use of my time, let's ask people who aren't nearly, who do not work nearly as hard to be on the committee. And I said, and I can help you come up with some names. And all of us in our schools can help us come up with some names of people who don't 
put forth that much effort. And the president had never thought about that. And then after that, the president would call me or email me regularly and say, we have a committee that's not very important. Can you name five people that you think could be a part of this that potentially do not work as hard as others? And then potentially they'd also contact me and say, we've got a crucial committee that's key to the future of our university. Who are three or four people that you really can recommend for that committee? And it was thinking of it that way, and that's the same way we have to think as leaders of a school in terms of delegation. I hope that makes sense. I don't know if that, anybody in the chat box has any thoughts or questions or comments on that, but I'm hoping that makes sense. Um, Deadwood, South Dakota, and Minnesota, awesome. Good to see you all. Columbus, Ohio. So uh, just kind of keep in mind that way. Okay, let's take a look here now at Shifting the Monkey. One way I want us to think about this, and it's, this is very appealing to good people, is the difference between establishing expectations and correcting behaviors. I don't want to correct behaviors. I want to establish expectations. For my principal friends that are there, when you are new to a school, it doesn't have to be your first principalship, but when you are new to a school, the second you open the door to that school, literally the first time you open the door, not the fifth time, not your second week, the first time you open the door to that school, did you know the secretary wants to know how you want him or her to answer the phone? Unless they're terrible, they want he or she wants to know how you want them to answer the phone. And it's because they want to please who? It's they want to please you. And you know what's amazing? The better they are, the more they want to please you. So what happens is if they have not answered the phone yet and I ask, share with them how I'd like them to answer the phone, your highest achieving, most important people, they will be all over that. Just think about yourself. How many of you can play the game but you'd like to know the rules? And when is it you want to know the rules? You want to know the rules before the game starts. You don't want to know the rules once the game starts. How many of you are in schools or districts or states where you feel like the rules of the game change midstream on a regular basis. And that's very frustrating. And the better the people, the more they want to know the rules. Well, let's say you have a very high, high uh, uh, skill, highly skilled secretary, clerical worker, office receptionist, whatever you want to call it. And let's say they answer the phone for two weeks. And now you tell them how you want them to answer the phone. What you've done at that point is you've clipped at your relationship with them. And the higher achiever they are, the more that hurts the relationship. And the really high achievers will remember that for a long, long time. And they're always going to have a little bit of shame, a little bit of guilt, a little responsibility. They want to know what the rules are. They just want to know what the rules are before the game starts. Okay? Hope that makes sense. Okay, monkeys. We're going to talk about monkeys here. Monkeys are responsibilities, obligations, and problems everybody deals with every day. But what makes them so different? is how they are spread, how they are shared. It would seem like everybody ought to have a half a dozen, a dozen monkeys, but as you know, your best people have 18, 20, 40, 50, whatever, and your worst people only have a couple, and they work hard to get rid of those all the time. They run from responsibility. And so what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to reposition these responsibilities to whatever degree you can. Here are the three questions that are driving questions as we go forward. In every situation, I want you to think, where's the monkey? Where should the monkey be? And how do I get it there? Okay? Think, where's the monkey in every situation? Where should the monkey be? And how do I get it there? And that last one is the responsibility of the leader. It's not the responsibility of anybody else. It's the responsibility of the leader. And I'll give you an example. Um, hi, hey, Pine Dial, Wyoming. Good to hear from you. Um, the, the other thing is, is that uh, I want you to think about this. Has anyone out there, and my guess is yes, has anyone out there ever supervised a basketball game, football game, play, band concert, or an assembly? By any chance, has anyone there ever supervised a play, band concert, or assembly? Okay. Let's pretend you're supervising a basketball game and there's a fan up in the stands acting like a fool. Who there's a fan up in the stands acting like a fool. Who are the most uncomfortable people in the stands? It's not the people around them. It's the normal people around them. 
there's a difference. Stop generalizing. It's very important if we want to improve our schools. The problem is not parents. The problem is this parent. The problem is not students. The problem is this student. The problem is not teachers. The problem is this teacher. When we generalize, we do two things. One is we insult good people when we generalize, and we actually allow the less effective people to hide. And so we cannot do that. So you have a fan up in the stands acting like a fool. Who are the most uncomfortable people in the stands? It'd be the good people around them. Okay? So in that situation, you have a fan up in the stands acting like a fool. You're supervising. And you have good people around the fans. Who has a monkey? Well, all of the good people. They feel uncomfortable. They feel weird. They feel awkward. They don't know what to do. You know how we look over and we kind of look at the people and, and aren't sure what to do and try to move away from them. Who else has a monkey? The leader does. You're responsible. You can never get rid of the monkey. You're shifting it. You're just moving part of it. You cannot get rid of the whole thing because that's what leaders do. You still have part of it. You just want to shift part of it. Who has no monkey? The person acting like a fool. Okay? Let's think about some different ways we can handle this. What do ineffective leaders do? Ineffective leaders, the most ineffective leaders, the most ineffective teachers, the most ineffective people, what they do is they avoid. They literally avoid it. It's up in the stands, so they kind of turn around and look this other direction, and they just avoid that. When we avoid a situation where there's a challenge like this, what happens is the group that's uncomfortable continues to get bigger. They're looking for guidance. They're looking for assistance. And what happens is they see no leadership out there. So more and more people get uncomfortable because that person continues to behave like that. The second level of leadership is what I call osmosis leadership. And what that means is we stand down here and we stare at the person and hope through osmosis. They know what they did wrong. They apologize to everyone around them. And then they turn in their season tickets. And once again, if we try to use osmosis leadership and we stare at the person, what happens is the group that's uncomfortable gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Some of them because they see the person acting like a fool. Some of them because they see you looking at the person acting like a fool. They're going, what's Todd looking at? What's he looking at? Oh, look, look, he's looking at them, he's looking at them, he's looking at them. And the group gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And instead what we want to do is we want to do something called treating people as if they were good. Okay? Remember, you're going to shift the monkey. You cannot get rid of it. We're going to treat people as if they were good. If this was a great fan, if this was an outstanding person, one of your best parents, what do you do when you see them? You seek them out. You try to be around them. You treat them friendly. You shake their hand. You be nice to them. You ask how their kids are doing, how school's going, what, what, what's going on here. So you're going to treat that person there as if they were good. Instead, what happens way too often is we treat people as if they were bad. The problem with treating people as if they were bad is bad people like it, and it makes good people uncomfortable. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to treat people as if they were good. And the reason you treat people as if they were good because good people like it, and it makes negative people uncomfortable. One of the reasons we treat people as if they were bad is because that's the way we get treated all the time. You go in a store clerk and they give the clerk a $20 bill and the clerk takes out a pen and marks it to see if it's real. How gross is that? It's even your cousin. You know, they're going, hi, Phyllis, and then marking your 20. I mean, isn't that an amazing thing there? And what happens is, when that happens to me, the first thing, they're treating everyone as if they were bad. They're assuming everybody's a criminal, everybody's wrong, everybody's a counterfeiter. And they insult the people that are good. I feel defenseless. The only thing I can do is when they give me my change back is I take out my pen and I mark it and then I bite the quarter to see if it's real. I mean, I feel like that's all I can do. Every time a clerk does that, one of the things I ask the clerk is, you've been getting a lot of counterfeit 20s around here? And guess what I've heard from every clerk I've ever asked? We've never had a one. But I guess they'll just keep insulting people till they do. So the first thing you can do with negative people is do something called treating people as if they were good. The second you see that fan in the stands, the second you have see any questionable behavior, the second you do, what do you do? You go, you go right next to them, and you sit next to them like they were in the nicest fan in the world. 
Hey, how you doing? You doing all right today? You know, we haven't won many games. We got a lead. Think we can hang on to here? Hasn't the weather been crazy? Last week it was so hot, I saw a dog chasing a cat, and they were both walking. Uh, hey, how's it going? What is going on? And as soon as you sit down, think about what happens. As soon as I sit down next to that difficult person, I shift monkeys. But I want you to be aware of who I'm concerned with first. Every decision I make is based on the good people. It's not based on the negative person. It's make on all the, based on all the good people. As soon as I sit down next to that negative person, I shift all the monkeys from all the good people that were uncomfortable. I take it off them, and I put it on me. As soon as I sit down, because now they don't have to worry about it, because I'm there so that I'm going to be the one that worries about it. And I'm going to treat that dysfunctional person as if they were good. Now, when we start to deal with negative people, there's a couple of things. One thing is this. We always treat negative people as if they were good. And the first thing we have to sort out, and this is so critical, the first thing we have to sort out is are they ignorant or insubordinate? And we almost always think people are insubordinate, and they're almost always ignorant. And ignorant may or may not, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a reflection of intelligence. It can be. But what it almost always means is they're unaware of how they come across. They don't have any sense of social norms. They're not sure how they behave. They don't know how they're being received by people. As soon as I sit next to that person, I treat them as if they were good. It takes all the pressure off the good people and puts it on me. If I treat that person as if they were bad, the problem is it makes the good people uncomfortable. If you've ever gone to a college football game, there's a slight chance someone was drinking. And what's interesting is that's fine if you're a student and you're hanging around and you're part of that club. But as you get older and you have children and you go to a college football game, there's people around you drinking. doesn't matter that they're drinking. It matters if they, how they behave when they're drinking. And if you have somebody who's out of control, who's cussing and who's yelling, you wish an usher, a policeman, a security person would come and deal with it. But you want them to deal with it in a respectful and, respectful and professional manner. Because if that policeman comes walking up and treats them as if they were bad, going, hey, 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 you in the blue, hey, hey, what happens is the group that's uncomfortable continue to get bigger because that person didn't shift the monkey from them, from, that, from you to them. That person continued to put more monkeys on other people. Give me a yes or no if that, answer, uh, that example makes any sense here in our little question box. If you could, I would appreciate it. Um, y or N if you're lazy. Um, okay. So, so we're going to do that, we're going to, and we're talk about treating people as if they were good. Two things that we have to do here. We're always going to be around negative people. Two things that we're going to do. One thing we're going to do with negative people is we always do something called the sidle up. That means we're always going to approach negative people from the side. Okay? It's kind of funny. When I wrote the book Shifting the Monkey, my spell check said sidle up. Sidle isn't a word. But I think something's wrong with my spell check because it also says irregardless isn't a word, and I'm positive it is. I've been, I've been using that one for years. Okay. Now let's think about why we sidle up. If I come up and sit right next to someone, there's two things. One thing is look how easy it is for the monkey to reach over and get on them. Okay? Understand this. This doesn't mean the whole monkey gets on them, but they get a paw right on them. Look how easy that is. If we're shoulder to shoulder, that monkey can get right there. The reason we approach negative people like this is because this is not the way negative people want to be approached. Do you know where I learned to sidle up? I learned to sidle up. Hint, water's excellent, by the way. I learned to sidle up um, by watching the best teacher in a school. I, I'm sorry if I misspoke. I didn't mean your best friend who's a teacher in the school. I apologize if I said that. I meant the best teacher in the school. How does the best teacher in a school approach the kids every day? from the side. They go up to them and they go, hi, did you have any questions on that homework? Did number nine make any sense? Did you get a chance to do that? The less effective teachers in a school, how do they approach students? Line in the sand. They approach them line in the sand. They go to them and go, do you want to teach? Do you want to teach? Would you like to take the chalk and teach? Do you want to take the chalk and teach? Would you like to take? How many of you have at least one or two teachers that would stop teaching and challenge kids in the middle of the room? And I'm not talking about intellectually. I'm talking about behaviorally. They challenge kids in the middle of the room by going, I'm sorry, did you two have something you wanted to say? Is what you had to say more important than what I had to say? Is what you had to say something the whole class could benefit from? Is what you had to say? When we do that, who did we decide were the most important students in the class? 
the kids that were being disrupted. And we have to remember who are the least important students in the class, the kids that are being disruptive. We can't make them out to be the most important when they're the least important. If you have a negative parent that comes marching into your office, comes in unannounced or announced, it doesn't make any difference, a belligerent parent that comes in, the first thing you do is you pull up a chair and you sit right next to them. I know you're thinking, Todd, I'd feel funny sitting next to them. Of course you would. There's nothing funny about sitting next to them. The difference is they also feel funny when you're sitting next to them. See, because if you put a desk or a, or a table between yourself and them, you empower them. What happens when you put a desk or a table between yourself and them? The monkey can't reach over there. That's their line in the sand. Realize when you're dealing with someone negative, you're going to be uncomfortable whether or not you're sitting next to them or across from them. So you might as well make sure that you shift some of that discomfort to them instead of keeping it all yourself. I hope that example makes sense. But the nice thing is, the beautiful part of this is, we don't have to just figure out who's good and who isn't to sidle up. The thing that we have to do is that, um, uh, the thing that we have to do is sidle up to everybody. So you don't have to differentiate. There's no risk then. Sidle up to everyone. Good people like it and it makes other people uncomfortable. The other thing that we're going to have to do that's so critical, and this is something that great teachers already do, great principals already do, you have to have an incredible ability to ignore. Ignore does not mean ignorant. Ignore means you choose to respond or not to respond to what they're doing. When you sit next to a difficult person, they're not going to smile and say, hi, well, welcome, good to see you, How can I, what can I do to help you? Good people will do that, but the people you're most nervous about won't. What they're going to do when you sit next to them is they're going to go, oh, uh, 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 and you're going to have to ignore that behavior. Do not feed it in. Do not give it to it. Where do we learn to ignore? The best teachers in your school, I don't care where you're at, from Montana to Mississippi, the best teachers in your school have an incredible ability to ignore. The worst teachers in your school have no ability to ignore whatsoever, and everyone else falls in place somewhere in between. Ignore is not un ignorant. Ignore is not unaware. Ignore means you're choosing to respond or not to respond. You're in charge of yourself, and that's where all of this starts. Think about the best teacher. There's a group of kids, the teacher's teaching, and there's a group of kids in the class sitting there talking. The teacher goes, hey, gang, let's be quiet. Don't students have a whole variety of responses? Some students say sorry and stop talking. Some students just stop talking. And some students say, we weren't the only ones talking. What does a great teacher have literally an unlimited ability to do? Ignore. What does the worst teacher have no ability to do whatsoever? Ignore. If that happens in the worst teacher's classroom, what does the worst teacher do? Yeah, but you're the ones I was talking to. And they continue to escalate that behavior. So we have to realize this because if we're going to be around negative people, we have to ignore their gestures, responses, the negative things. In any of your schools, I'm just asking this, do any of you by any chance have anyone that's a cereal powder? Do you have anyone who's a cereal powder? Their go-to is the pout. Do any of your schools have emotionally reserved parking? I mean, I'm even starting there, but do any of you have cereal powders? Okay. That cereal powder gets that big lip out there. They're all upset. And they're sitting like this. What are the two things people typically do with them? They either avoid them, which is gross. Just think about that. He's upset. He is upset. Do not bother him. See, their reward is they do less than anybody else. We don't even ask them to do their fair share. We just take care of it so we don't upset them anymore. They're literally using the pouting as a weapon, and it's working. The other thing we do, which is equally harmful, is we empathize with them. Oh, it's okay. They're mean to lots of people. And nobody he repeats a behavior without a reward, and their reward is they do less than everybody else. I bring this up because one thing as a leader, you have to be around negative people all the time. You have to continually be around negative people. The reason other people in your school are afraid of them is because they see the leaders are afraid of them. And there's nothing wrong with being afraid. There's only something wrong with acting afraid. Because when you go up to that negative person after a three-day weekend, fall break, spring break, holiday break, whatever this is, and you see them and you go, hey, how was your holiday? 
what do the normal people say? It was great. How was yours? The weather was crazy. Looking forward to it. It was nice to get that refreshment. What do your negative people say? Not once. What do they say all the time? You go and see them. You go, hey, how was your holiday? What do they say? Stomach flu coming out of both ends. And I'm thinking, oh, my land, thank you so much for telling me right after we shook hands. You know, would it be uncomfortable if I licked your forehead? But what happens is they're saying that so you either keep a distance or you empathize with them, and that's what happens. But instead what we have to do is we have to be around people, we have to sidle up, and then we have to ignore eye rolls and things like that. Got a question for you, and I'm going to ask my group here this, and you can answer it in the little uh, answer box there. How many of you potentially are going on car trips this summer? Uh, congratulations, Audrey, on the person that's retiring this year. Congratulations. Um, uh, there's a chance they retired four years ago. They just never turned in their letter, but that's a different issue. How many of you are potentially going on long car trips this summer, okay? How many of you are going on long car trips with children this summer? How many are going on car trips this summer with children that will seem long? When your child says, how much farther is it as you're backing down the driveway, did you, you know you have no legal obligation whatsoever to respond? And when we re respond in any way, we encourage the behavior to be repeated. You have to be around negative people. You have to ask how they're doing. But when they go, not no well, at some point you just say, have a good one, and you keep going. You do not kill them with kindness. Kill them with kindness builds up resentment in the rest of the people because you treat them better than you treat the negative people better than anyone else. And you can't treat the negative people better than anyone else. You can't kill them with kindness. Okay. We talked about this. We're going to treat everybody as if they were good. Do not punish people for being good. That's one of the things we do all the time. The other day I was working with a school that had a problem with a student writing on the stall doors in the bathrooms. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Writing on the stall doors in the bathrooms. They couldn't catch the kid. Do you know what the school did? Took down the stall doors. They took down the stall doors because they decided the student writing on the stall doors was the most important student in the school. I want you to please be aware the student writing on the stall doors is the least important student in the school. Please do not punish everyone else for being good. Has anyone ever heard of a school having a whole school assembly the first day of school and lecturing all the kids about the rules? Which kids are most uncomfortable with that assembly? The good ones. What are the other kids doing? Plotting. That's what they're doing. They are plotting. And you've never had a kid start to skip school in April and go, wait a minute, didn't we discuss that during orientation? And so we cannot do that. I'm going to give you one example here. It's the second to the last one on those lists. Pretend to represent others. How many of you know of a parent, a student, or a staff member that bends toward negative, bends sharply toward negative, and always pretends they're representing lots of other people? Has anybody had that in your school or in your situation? They come up and they go, there's a whole bunch of people. There's a bunch of people. Oh, my land, there's a whole bunch of people that are mad. There's a bunch of people that are mad. Does anybody have anybody like that? Okay. What I want you to do is instead of treating them as if they were bad, I want you to treat them as if they were good. Let's think about this. Let's pretend Amy Lowe, is it Amy Lowe or Law? I can't remember here. I'm going to put on my glasses. Amy Lowe there. Amy Lowe is my best teacher, my best parent, my best student. Amy is the best. She's the single best person. I'm a principal. Amy comes up to me and says, Todd, there's a bunch of people that are upset with the way you handled that meeting. If you have more than one person there in your group, I just want you to take 15 seconds, and if you're by yourself, you can just reflect on this or put it in your uh, uh, question box there. I want you to think, what's the first sentence or two you should say to Amy? Amy's the best teacher in a school. Amy comes up and says, Todd, there's a bunch of people that are upset with the way you handled that meeting. I'm the principal. Which person is Amy? She's the best, the best parent, the best student, the best teacher. Amy comes up, she's a teacher in my school, and says, Todd, there's a bunch of people that were upset with the way you handled that meeting. Take 15 or 20 seconds and share with a partner, or just reflect yourself. Feel free to share it in the answer box here. What's the first sentence or two we should say to Amy? Okay. Let's see what we got. I love the blanket email. We'll get to that. Thank you so much for sharing, Christopher. Okay, who was it? I wanted I asked how many Amy feels. How is a bunch? Do you feel that way? Can you tell me who? It's a shame the rest did not voice their concerns. I'd like to help. Um, okay. 
I'm sorry, I'd like to go apologize to them. Okay, now here's what I want you to think. Amy's the best. Is Amy telling the truth? Of course she is. What do you say to Amy? Amy's coming to you with monkeys. She feels this pressure because other people are upset with the way you handled this meeting. Every single time I'm around a good person, every time, not some of the time, every time I'm around a good person, my goal is to take monkeys off them and put them on me. I want you to reflect on what you said or what people in the room said and think which ways are monkeys going, okay? Who were they? Have them come see me. Who all was involved? How could I have done it different? What did you think? How should I have done it different? What should I do differently in the future? How many people was it? What is a bunch? Which way are the monkeys going? I'm dumping on Amy. She's getting more monkeys all the time. Who were they? Have them come see me. Who all was involved? Do you know what she's learned? Don't come and tell Todd. Because you don't feel better when you communicate with Todd. You feel worse when you communicate with Todd. And I've dumped on her. Does that make sense? Instead, we're going to treat her as if we were good. Do you know what you're going to say to Amy? Amy, thank you so much for telling me that. I am sick about this. Amy, I owe you a personal apology, and I need to personally apologize to every single one of those people. I am sick about this. Thank you so much for sharing. If you could get me a list, I will go around to every one of those people individually and apologize. I am sick about this. Thank you so much for telling me that. How does Amy feel? There's a load off her back. She knows you're going to fix it. She knows you're going to take care of it. Okay? Now, what do we do? Sonia here. Sonia, who said I'd like to help. Sonia, let's, we're going to pretend. Sonia, this is hypothetical. I only pick on the smart, good-looking people. So Sonia is um, uh, uh, one of the more negative fa faculty members who's always coming up with things like this. And Sonia comes up and says, Todd, there's a bunch of people that are upset with the way you handled that meeting. How do I treat Sonia? Well, we're going to treat everyone as if they were good. We just showed you how you treat Amy, so this is how you treat Sonia. Sonia, thank you so much for telling me. I am sick about this. Sonia, I owe you a personal uh, apology, and I need to personally apologize to every single one of those people. If you could get me a list, I will personally go around and apologize. What's different? It isn't my tone. It isn't my voice. If I sounded different, it's only because I wasn't, didn't remember how I talked exactly the last time. Both of them have sincere. There's no snark. You cannot have snark. You can't out smart aleck a smart aleck. What I'm doing with Sonia is when I said, if you could get me a list, do you see what happens? Amy comes to me and says, there's a bunch of people upset because there's a bunch of people that are upset. Sonia comes up to me and says, there's a bunch of people upset because she's upset. She's pretending she represents other people. So when I say, if you could get me a list, guess what she's going to say? Um, they, they, they asked me to represent them. They, 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 they wanted me to be the spokesperson. They're, they're uncomfortable when you come around them. And what happens is then is that by me saying, if you could get me a list, I've given her a task. I've shifted the monkey to her. With Amy, everything I'm doing is taking pressure off her and putting it on me. With Sonia, everything I'm doing is taking pressure off me and putting it on her. Sonia does not want responsibility. Sonia will run from responsibility. She'll go, that, 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 that's okay. They, they don't like it when you're around them. But understand, I'm always around my negative people. So the next day, I go up to Sonia. What's it called when you stand next to her? That's right, sidle up. I go to Sonia and I say, have a good day. See, right now the monkey's on her because she, she, had, she pretended she had a list. Because she's someone who's potentially dishonest and rep misrepresents things. I didn't call her a liar. I don't accuse her of being a liar. I treat her as if she was good. I'm her conscious now. I come walking up, she's uncomfortable. And I go, hey, Sonia, how you doing today? And that's it. If I bring up the list every day, I chop off the monkey's arm. I want the monkey stay, arm staying right on her because she was someone who was misrepresenting the truth. And so I'm always approaching her in that fashion. She will behave for a while because she feels guilty, but eventually she won't be able to and she'll fall back into her previous negative routines. And at some point, she'll just do like she always says, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about this? And I go, did you ever get a chance to get that list? Did you get that list? Do you remember that list? What happens is she's uncomfortable. She doesn't want to be reminded of the list, and she'll stop being a negative in terms of dealing with that. I guarantee this will make a difference. But what we have to do first, we have to literally start tomorrow, if we haven't already been doing it, being around our negative people all the time. Because if we're not around them all the time, they get defensive when we are around them. Instead, if we're around them all the time, they're not ready for us to treat them as if they were good. If you do that one little change, that 
one little subtle change tomorrow. And the reason you've been avoiding it, because they might complain, they bring up an issue, they whine about something, but now you understand you have the ability to ignore. So you feel no obligation to take that on. Okay? So I want you to start tomorrow by being around people, but now you're more prepared when they bring up the list, when they say something like that. Treat them as if they were good, and that's so important. Remember, avoid is not a strategy. Okay? Don't punish people for being good. I want to give you another example here. You're the filter. You decide what comes out of your mouth and what doesn't. You decide who you share stif stuff with and who you don't. One of the things I want us to avoid more than anything else is this. I want us to avoid blanket monkeys. Let's think about how much we're the filter. And as leaders, we know this. Just once in a while, it gets to be April, and we're whipped, and we're worn out, and the honeymoon's long been over, and the end isn't near in sight, and we've got state testing coming up, and it's just a lot. Keep this in mind. When, you, when people say, how are you doing, do you know what you say? You say, great, how are you? But you know what else you do? You teach all your teachers to do that. You're a principal, you're in the office, and you've got a negative parent in there, Mrs. Smith. You cannot get Mrs. Smith out of your office. Finally, you get a crowbar and you wedge her out of your office. You walk out in the hallway and a teacher goes, hey, how are you doing today? You know what you say? I'm doing great, how are you? How does that help anybody to say, oh, that Mrs. Smith, that Mrs. Smith, that Mrs. Smith? Everybody who has a kid named Smith is now scared to death. Everybody who has a student named Smythe is now scared to death, just in case you mispronounce the last name. And everybody who has a student who has a step-parent, the step-parent's last name is different than the student's, is now scared to death, just in case the step-parent's last name is Smith. The reason I mention this about filters is because you have to teach your teachers they're the filter, too. How many of you, and you can just answer yes or no one way or the other, how many of you live and work in communities where potentially during the summer you may cross paths with prospective students and parents. Do any of you live in communities where you could uh, potentially cross paths with prospective students and parents? Do we have anybody at any of our locations there? Okay. Fourth of July parade or picnic. There's still plenty of time. You haven't even started your night sweats yet. Fourth of July parade or picnic. Okay. A parent and prospective student are walking across the grounds and they see the best teacher in a school. And they say to the best teacher in the school, hey, you ready for school to start? What does the best teacher say? Oh, yeah, looking forward to it. I sure hope I get you. I just put up my bulletin boards today. I, I hope I get you. I loved having your nine cousins. That student and parent have a little pep in their step, don't they? They feel a little better. Because that teacher filtered out any negativity before they communicated. They have to realize we are the filter. We're in charge of that. That prospective student and parent walk a little farther, they cross paths with the most negative teacher in a school. And they go, hey, you ready for school to start? What does the worst teacher say? No, no, no. And the parent's thinking, oh, my land, I wish my children could be transferred into your classroom. What a double-decker pleasure bus that must be each and every day there. And you know what else that parent's thinking? Did, did you know I, I work 12 months a year and you work nine? You know what else that parent's thinking? Did you know I pay your salary? You know what else some of those parents are thinking? Do you know you get paid more than I do? And we've got to be able to filter these things out. And that goes along with Blanket Monkey. I'll give you an example. Has anyone here ever had a field trip? And the field trip bus came back at 7.30. I mean, the field trip bus came back at 5 o'clock, and a parent doesn't come till 7.30. Has anybody ever had that happen? That's what I refer to as a delight. That's delightful when that happens, okay? You have a field trip. The field trip bus comes back at 5 o'clock, and a parent doesn't come till 7.30, okay? In average schools, with average principals, and average teachers, in average states, in average countries, do you know what we do? We send notes home. We send emails home. And who do we send the notes or the emails to? everybody. It's called a blanket monkey. Instead of dealing with the person we need to be dealing with, we throw a blanket on everybody. Oftentimes, state departments are really good at blanket monkeys. Let's pretend you live in a state. Okay, I see somebody from Tennessee. Let's pretend you live in a Tennessee. And let's pretend Tennessee has two dysfunctional districts and eight dysfunctional schools. I do not know I'm making the numbers up. How many districts and schools should the state, be, state department be dealing with? They ought to be dealing with two districts and eight schools. How many do they deal with? 
all the districts and all the schools. There's new regulations for everybody, new guidelines for everybody, new A through F for everybody, new teacher evaluation for everybody, new test, state tests for everybody. They blanket monkey people. Instead of directing the things where they should be directed to, they throw it on everybody. What happens in many schools in many states is superintendents go to meetings at the State Department. I talked to the superintendents in Kansas City about this just this morning. And they go to there and they get blanket monkey. So guess what they do when they go back to their school? They blanket monkey. My principal friends, have you ever received a note that said some principals have not turned in the reports yet? Which principal is most uncomfortable when that note comes around? The best principal. And you know what they're thinking? Hey, King Wiener, there's only nine of us. You know which two it is. Why don't you deal with them instead of dealing with me? But do you know what happens with average principals? then they got blanket monkey, so they blanket monkey their teacher. Have you ever seen a note come around that said some teachers have not turned in their grades yet? Which teachers are most uncomfortable when that note comes around? The best teacher. And what do they do when they get to that note? They run down the open and say, oh my goodness, did I not turn in my grades yet? Luckily, I've made five backup copies. And I kept one of them at home in the refrigerator just in case there's a house fire. And by addressing negative people's behavior within the group, what we actually do is we actually let the negative people off the hook. Because if I haven't turned in my grades yet and that note comes around, you know what I'm thinking? Oh, good. Whew. There must be a whole bunch of us. That's why they sent the note. In our schools, I'm guessing in average schools, on most days, students are not allowed to wear hats. Okay? I'm guessing in most schools, students are not allowed to wear hats. It's okay if they do. If you, if you allow it, I don't care, but I'm using an example. I'm pretending schools do not allow students to wear hats. In a school, you have two kids walking down the hallway with hats. Do you know what you have? You have what I call a two-kid problem. You don't have a hat problem. Do you know how I know you don't have a hat problem? Because you have 793 kids not walking down the hallway with hats. We don't need to talk about hats. We don't need an announcement about hats. We don't need a new rule about hats. We need somebody to deal with the two kids. And I want you to think about which teachers in a school want to talk about hats. The worst ones. They want to talk about hats and cell phones and dress codes and tardies and pencils. Anything but teaching and learning. Quit making a two-kid problem a school-wide problem. Keep it exactly where it is. Don't blanket monkey people. Don't make announcements. At that basketball game, when I sit next to that person, I deal with that person. I tell that person what I need them to do, how I need them to do it, what's going to happen. I don't get on the intercom. I don't need to tell anybody else. It's just them. I need to keep it exactly where it is related to this. Okay? We talked about the uh, field trip. That's the middle one here. Field trip bus comes at 5 o'clock. A parent arrives at 730. I use this example because my very first year as a teacher, I was in Keatsville, Missouri. If anybody knows where Keatsville is, it's a suburb of Salisbury. Um, that's a joke. Anyhow, um, I love Keatsville. I actually love, love being there. We had a field trip, and the field trip bus got back at 5 o'clock, and a parent didn't come until 7.30. I'm a new teacher. I'm 22. I'm a new teacher. I'm just in the faculty meeting. And the teachers are mad, which I understand. I'm not being critical of them at all. The teachers are mad. And the uh, principal says, don't worry, I'm going to send a note home to all of the parents. I raised, uh, The teachers seemed happy. I raised my hand, and I said, why would we send it to all the parents? He goes, what do you mean? I go, does that mean we're assuming the most dysfunctional student will take a note home to the most dysfunctional parent who will make a mental note of the fact that seven weeks from now, when there's another field trip, I need to make sure I'm there on time. And he goes, what should we do? And I said, what we should do is we should call the parent. And he goes, what would you say? And you know what I said at 22, first-year teacher who doesn't know anything? I even I know less now even then. But you know what I said? I'll call him. He goes, what are you going to say? I go, I don't know. I'll call him. And the principal said, can I listen? And I said, sure. About 10 teachers go, can we listen? I said, sure. And he goes, okay, so we'll call the parent right after the meeting. And I said, why would we call the parent after the meeting? He said, what do you mean? I said, Think about this. In a teacher's classroom, in a great teacher's classroom, when a student misbehaves, and it happens to all of us, we know that, in a great teacher's classroom, when a student misbehaves, what does the great teacher want? They want prevention. They want it not to happen again. That's their only goal. They want it not to happen again. 
in a less effective teacher's classroom when a student misbehaves. What does the less effective teacher want? They want revenge. They want a public bloodletting. I said, why would we send it to all the parents? And I'm going to call the parent, but why would I call the parent the day after the field trip? That's revenge. That's my feelings were hurt. That's you ticked me off. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the parent the day before the next field trip. I don't understand why everybody doesn't think like this. Where's the monkey? The monkey's on you. The monkey's on the teachers that had to wait. Where else is the monkey? On the kid that was there by themselves. Where's no monkey? On the parent. And if you blanket monkey, if you send it to all the parents, guess which parent feels most uncomfortable? The best parent. You know what they're thinking? They're thinking, I'm, I'm sorry if I was late. I was there before the bus, but there were other parents ahead of me. I, you need to know I was volunteering at the orphanage, and I feel bad that I was running late. I mean, just think, because people like you, your life is dri completely driven by guilt. I don't want to add more monkeys to it. I want to take monkeys off it. The principal said, okay, Todd, so if you call this parent, the day before the field trip, what are you going to do if the parent says, are you picking on me? Are you calling all the parents or are you just calling me? I said, I don't know, but I'll do it. He goes, can I still listen? I said, that'd be great. I said, let me know the day before the next field trip because I don't keep track of them and, and you know it. He said, that'd be great. I said, okay. Do we have the day field trip? The principal's in there. There's like three teachers listening. I pick up the phone and I call the parent and here's what I say. Hi, Mrs. Johnson. This is Todd Whitaker. I'm Kevin's math teacher. I'm Kevin's principal. I'm Kevin's whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Third grade teacher, second grade teacher. And I, I was wondering if I could get your help with something. As you know, we have a field trip tomorrow. And the field trip bus gets back at 5 o'clock. And we're updating our emergency contact information. Because if somebody isn't there at 5 o'clock, we need to know what to do at 5 o'clock at that point if someone isn't there. So we're just updating our emergency contact information because of the 5 o'clock field trip bus tomorrow. The parents say, and there's no smart out, no snark. The parent says, your, the fear of the principal was the parent says, you calling all the parents? Are you picking on me? Are you calling all the parents? Are you just calling me? You do have to understand bullies always think they're being bullied. No matter who they are, no matter what position they're in, no matter how old they are, no matter where they are in the world, bullies always think they're being bullied. They always think they're being picked on, being hassled, being treated unfairly, even though that's what they do constantly. It's an amazing thing. Anyhow, the parent said, um, are you calling all the parents? And I said, I wasn't going to say anything because I wanted to help you save face. But when you challenged me, I felt obligated. I'm just calling you. And the reason I'm just calling you, the last time we had a field trip, your child was humiliated. He was so embarrassed. He was there by himself for two and a half hours. And I don't want any kids in the school to be embarrassed. And I don't want your son to be embarrassed. And I wasn't going to say anything about it, except for the fact that you challenged me and asked if I was picking on you. But I'm only calling you because your son was the only one that was there for two and a half hours. So what should we do tomorrow if somebody isn't there at 5 o'clock? Because I cannot get off the phone without knowing what to do at 5 o'clock tomorrow. And if the parent says, throw the kid in the trunk of the car and take him to his grandma's, I'm tossing him. That's fine. My muffler's got a hole in it, but I drive fast, so I don't think it's too dangerous. Now, understand this. I called out of concern for who? The child. Most people call out of concern for who? Themselves. They call out of concerns for themselves. You know, I have a family, too. You know, I have a personal life, too. My son has baseball practice. I have to make supper, whatever this is. And the parent doesn't care about that. The parent may or may not even care about their child, but for sure, if they're a person who's very removed, they don't care about your child. Think about signs on the door to a school. You ever seen a sign that says all visitors must report to the office and must is all bold? Isn't that funny? We're assuming, by doing this, we're assuming the intruder is going to come down to the office, sign in, and confess. And I'm not making light of school safety. I'm writing a book called Be Safe, Not Scared with a school safety expert because that's the line. I want you to feel safe and I don't want you to feel scared. By doing this, what we're doing is we're treating everybody as if they were bad. If your life's a sign, put up a sign that says, Welcome parents, guests, and visitors. Thank you so much for your cooperation and support. We appreciate it. We do ask that all parents and visitors sign in at the office for the protection of all our students, faculty, and staff. Welcome to our school. Thank you so much. Something along that line, because now you're talking to the 99%, not the 1%. And that's so important that we don't do this. My teacher friends. Remember, have you got a note that says some teachers have not turned in their grades yet? Which teacher's most concerned? 
Have any of you ever been at a faculty meeting where the principal talks to the faculty and they're talking about two teachers, but they're talking to all the teachers? Some teachers, sometimes some of you are coming late, sometimes some of you. Some of you are not following the dress code, sometimes some of you. Who feels the most guilt? The best people, but they also feel the most annoyance because they want somebody to deal with them. They just want them to deal with them in a prof professional, respectful manner. And that's so important in terms of what we do and how we deal, this, deal with this. I want you to always remember what we talked about here. These are the three questions. Where's the monkey? Where should the monkey be? And how do I get it there? And we're constantly sorting that out. Whenever you go to faculty meetings, whenever you do things like this, I want you to think about the setting there. Okay? Going to share with you a quick thing. Faculty meetings. Everybody's there. This is so important. Think about the scenario in terms of seating. Okay? Difficult people, where do they sit at faculty meetings? They tend to sit together in the back near the door. Who are the most comfortable people in the room? They are. Who knows it? Everybody. For two years, I was an assistant principal, and here's what the faculty meetings look like. Empty rows at the front. Gradually, people started filling in, and the negative people didn't have one table. They pushed two together. Those people ran the room. What do you do? The first thing you do is you carry out every single extra table and chair. Why don't you just stack the chairs up in the back? Because they go get them where you're at, too, don't they? Switch the back to the front, the front to the back. Now the difficult people get their last. What's the only row that's left open? The front row. And you can have them in clusters or groups. The whole concept is having some intentionalness behind how you approach things. And after we got rid of the emotionally reserved section, I switched the back to the front, the front to the back. I brought the two tables the difficult people used to sit at, and then I put food all over it so they couldn't sit there again. And my assistant principal always came into the faculty meeting last and always sat next to the most difficult teacher in the room. Always smiling, always polite, always respectful. If you have a meeting at a rectangular table and you put your stuff at one end, where do the negative people sit? The other end or against the wall. Instead, you know what you do? Have a leaderless group, let everybody else sit in, and you squeeze in wherever you need to. What do the best teachers do when they take their kids to an assembly? They sit by the most challenging kids, and they don't do it mean. They don't do it respectfully. They act like it's all a coincidence. What do the worst teachers do? Stand against the wall, sit away from them, give them plenty of room, and then complain about their behavior after the fact. That same thing we have to do here. Remember, we have to always think, where's the monkey? Where should the monkey be? And how do I get it there? Okay. Well, it looks like we got about one minute or so. If anybody has a question, wants to put it on the little question box, if not, you can always tweet me at, at Todd Whitaker. Um, my website's toddwhitaker.com. If you ever want to visit, Give me a holler. I'm nobody, but if you'd like to have some uh, uh, a chance to visit one-on-one -on -one time for questions, let me know. If anybody takes a look at the book, it'll take you about one average restroom visit to finish. It's not very long. I'd love to know what you think about it, okay? I appreciate everyone joining. I hope this makes sense. I want you to just start thinking in every situation, wait a minute, where's the monkey? How do I get the monkey off good people, put it on me? How do I get the monkey off me and put it on other people who may not put forth the effort? that the very best people have, okay? You all are incredible. Shanna, thank you for your kind words. Christopher, wonderful. Uh, Jamie, uh, thank you so much for saying things. But if anybody, if I can help anybody anytime, give me a holler. This is all about protecting our teachers so that the teachers then can protect the students. And you can teach your teachers this because they can do the exact same thing with students in their classroom. It works with parents. It works in the community. It works in the home. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you taking time out of the busy schedule, and have a wonderful remainder of the school year. Thank you.